Ontario Tech University who is going to tell us about how we can use light to turn uh, down, uh, silence gene expression. Uh, Jean-Paul. Okay. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks to the organizers for the uh, you know, kind invitation to uh, speak at this at this uh, symposium. It's a real honor and privilege to speak after Mano and Phil Barron, and what a beautiful uh, tribute to Professor Kurana. So I'm delighted to talk to you about some of the work today that we're doing with photoresponsive nucleic acids for RNA interference. And there we go. Okay, uh, no disclosures or conflicts to report. Okay, so this slide, of course, really needs no introduction. As we know, uh, double-stranded RNAs are loaded into risk. Uh, guide strand is selected into the risk complex, targets messenger RNA. We get efficient uh, gene silencing. And this has been, uh, you know, very productive. Here are four of the five uh, US FDA-approved siRNAs, uh, with, of course, many more in advanced clinical trials. So it's, of course, a very exciting time for um, oligonucleotides and siRNAs. Um, so before I talk about photochemical uh, SRNAs, I just want to give you a very broad, quick overview of some of the work we do in our lab. You know, we're really focused on expanding some of the chemical architecture and assessing the biocompatibility of different types of chemical modifications within SRNAs. So some of the work that we've done previously involved exploring different scaffolds like, you know, uh, PNA-type scaffolds with triazoles or PNA-type scaffolds with amide bonds. Uh, more recently, we've looked at things like folic acids, uh, small molecules, the tag sRNAs, and unnatural molecules like uh, cubane. We have a fond interest in modifying the backbone, and some of the work that we've done involves uh, tagging them with these hydrophobic uh, phosphate trister tails. If you'd like to learn more, please check out Matthew's uh, poster. And uh, we're also interested in using photosensitizers, coral molecules attached to sRNAs, so please uh, check out Ifredet's poster if you're interested in that, in that as well. Um, but really, a lot of these projects were inspired by some work that we had done 10 years ago, in which we had taken these very simple spacer linkages and we've placed them across a central region of the passenger strand and assessed their biocompatibility with RNA interference. We knew they'd be thermally destabilizing. They replaced two nucleobases, um, but they were actually very efficiently good at knocking down, uh, the, uh, or very good at RNA interference. So we wanted to sort of expand on this scope, and we wanted to look at things like conformationally constrained groups. So you can see here we have a biphenyl that works really, really well, which brings us to the topic of this talk. Can we incorporate an azo benzene embedded within that matrix to control uh, gene silencing with different colored lights? Before I talk to you about azobenzene, benzene, of course, these are paramount issues that we're all very familiar with, with issues related to RNA tools and therapeutics, stability, um, cellular uptake and delivery uh, remains a challenge, biodistribution, mean activation of target effects. But what I'd like us to think about uh, today is, um, you know, how can we control the activity of an sRNA once it's already inside of the cell? Um, and here's some work that was published uh, about four years ago by Al Nilam, in which they uh, designed an sRNA targeting TTR mice. They did an injection at day zero. You can see a rapid reduction in TTR protein. Um, but what, what, what they did at day seven is that you can see they added this reverse here molecule, which is a single strand comprising of a GALNAC, and uh, you have these chemical modifications like LNA competing for the seed region, and very quickly they were able to reverse that RNA interference activity. So with many of these therapeutics, you know, we're seeing them lasting months, uh, and who knows, maybe in the future, even years at a time. That, that's very, very exciting, of course, but there may be instances where we want to be able to control it and uh, not have such a long-lasting effect or be able to reverse it um, whenever we want to. So let's go back to isobenzene. So isobenzene is a molecule that can isomerize between a transform and a cis form reversibly. In this case, we can use UV light to go from trans to cis, or visible light, uh, or sorry, UV light or heat to thermally go back to the transform. So we envision based on our 
sort of our chemical promiscuity model with our linkages, whether we can place this at the central region and whether we can control the activity using UV or visible light. So you can see in this model, uh, we would have an active form, we could distort it potentially with UV light, making it inactive at visible light to reactivate it. We're certainly not the first people to think of photochemically controlling uh, gene expression. You know, just some very quick, uh, you know, really elegant work on the left. We have some nice work by McCann and Helco where they have these photochemical bulges attached so it couldn't form properly. At UV light, these are released, so you commence RNA interference. More recent example, by Mayer and Mokir, which they have this five prime anthocyanin group released with single oxygen species with red or green light, and then you can commence RNA interference. And then a, a more recent example on the far right is uh, some work done by Dieters and co-workers where they have the cyclic morpholino held together through a photolabile linker, uh, injected into zebrafish embryo, UV light breaks that apart, and then it can target the RNA, and you can commence gene silencing. So these are all you know, wonderful advances. They share one common theme though, is that they are irreversible, and you cannot go from an active state to an inactive state. So the first thing we want to do is to see whether we could you know, mimic some of those models that we've just seen. So we took our active sRNA, we inactivated it with UV light, we cell transfected it, and then we wanted to see whether we could reactivate that at a certain time point in the cell. So I'll walk you through some of this data. So I have a heat map here where you'll see luciferase activity. Uh, lighter blue corresponds to high luciferase activity, so poor gene silencing. Uh, the lighter the yellow, low luciferase, good gene silencing. So if you look at the left, column with UV in eight hours, um, you can see um, sort of black and blue, which would correspond to, you know, poor gene silencing. So this occurs, um, you know, after we, uh, you know, when we transfect the cell with an inactive sRNA. If we take this uh, same experiment at four hours later, add a short burst of visible light, you can see some restoration of activity as denoted by, uh, you know, more predominant yellow colors. So from the short library here, we can turn that on. And our dark control here, you can see, um, you know, yellow, of course, which corresponds to very effective gene silencing for all those four or five siRNAs. We can do this for up to 24 hours, so we can keep this inactive, um, but what we do have to do is we have to give the cell short bursts of UV light every four hours to keep it in an inactive state. And we are limited to the fact that this azobenzene in this confirmation year has a, has a half-life of roughly four hours at 37 degrees. So if we do not do this, it will thermally relax back and we have observers and we will start commencing gene silencing. But we can start this and control it with visible light, as you can see, and so it gives us some spatial control. So we're also interested in doing this for not only luciferase, but also an endogenous target. So we looked at uh, BCL2, and you can see a very similar pattern. So with uh, the UV light uh, on the left, with the eight hours, you can see a predominance of blue corresponding to poor gene silencing, high BCL2 expression. We can start seeing some gene, good gene silencing with the uh, four hours UV light after, as denoted by the visible column, and then our dark control on the right. And you can see we can keep this uh, inactive for up to 24 hours using the same type of uh, procedure that I described previously. And then we can turn it on four hours later with visible light and you can see our dark control. So we were certainly very, uh, you know, very, very excited and happy with these results, but we wanted to see whether we could test and go a step further and see whether we could reversibly control the activity of these siRNAs. So is this process reversible? Can we? actively transfect an sRNA, inactivate it, and then reactivate it, and then furthermore, could we re-inactivate it and then re-reactivate it? So could we go through two cycles of activation? These were some of the things we were asking ourselves. So we did an experiment over 24 hours looking at the reversible activity of an sRNA, and I'll walk you through the data. So with our UV experiment, it's fairly straightforward. Like I said, we keep it controlled every four hours with UV light. And then we want to do a UV vis UV experiment. So we, we inactivated it with UV light, and then we added uh, visible light four, hour, or two, yeah, four hours later, and then a couple hours later, we added UV light again, and we kept UV light again on for the remainder of the experiment. So we wouldn't expect it to necessarily have super strong gene silencing activity, and that's basically what we get at the lower concentrations. We do see some gene silencing, of course, at the higher concentrations. And then we want to look at this full two cycle process. So uh, UV inactivation, visible light, a couple hours later, re-inactivate it with UV light, and then 
for the remainder of the experiment, give it a short blast of visible light, and we would expect it after two rounds and near the end, it'd be predominantly in an active form, and we can see good effective dose dependent gene silencing. Our dark control shows, of course, the best, but this was never subjected to on and off, um, on and off uh, inactive or active states. Okay, so as I said before, we were limited in the fact that we had to, um, you know, this azobenzene has a very, you know, has a thermally relaxed half-life of four, of four hours. It'll go back to the trans. And furthermore, UV lights, you know, let's all agree, it's not the best thing to use on a, on a patient or an individual. Um, well, it's, it, it can be biotoxic, and of course, it doesn't penetrate tissue very well. So we're very interested in redshifting you know, what is known as the end of pi star transition, or the, basically the tr trans assist transition. And we were inspired by some work by uh, Dirk Tronner where they did a pulse functionalization with chlorine in order to redshift this so we could avoid using UV light. So we took azobenzene, and uh, you know, the chemists were very excited and using you know, metals and different methodologies. So we were able to tetrachlorinate this group, and then we could you know, remove those acetyl groups and then easily make our phosphoramidite which is, our, of course, our building block for chemical RNA synthesis. So I'll tell you some of the data that we received from uh, th these experiments here. And in this system, we can use red light or violet light to control the activity. So um, the first thing we did was we looked at, so we made a short library of uh, these chlorinated azobenzenes within that central region. And we wanted to see whether we could keep this off for eight hours. Okay. so. Yes, we could do that. We could take these uh, sRNAs, keep them inactive for three, for eight hours. Uh, but one thing we had to do is we had to um, keep the red light on persistently. So these tetrachlorinated groups have a, have a pretty short half-life uh, within minutes. So if we remove the red light, and I'll show you the data in a second, we actually it will relax back to the transform, and then we can initiate gene silencing. Maybe that's not such a bad thing, so we could think of a state where you have red light, you can kind of control its inactivation and then release it at some point, and red light is not toxic. So we could do this for eight hours, we could do this for uh, 24 hours as well, and we tried this for not just sRNA1, but sARNA2, and you can see a very similar pattern in activation, keeping it controlled under that red light for eight to 24 hours, and then removing it, thermal, and getting gene silencing. So you can see the similar pattern for all three siRNAs, and then uh, our wild tape control, of course, has no effect on gene silencing, or has no effect, the, the light doesn't control the gene silencing. So this was, you know, we were certainly excited about this, uh, but it's not very practical to, to use red light unless you want to be in a, you know, a, a red room all the time, potentially. So it's, it's not perhaps very practical, but we we're happy that we were able to move away from UV light. Now, I was, we were learning more about these azobenzene switches, and you know, we had gone to, you know, Andrew Woolley invited us to a photopharmacology conference last, uh, a couple years ago, online, of course, and we were, you know, we got inspired by some work with using these tetrafluorinated groups, and uh, tetrafluorinated azobenzenes have been used extensively, you know, in things like small molecules, a lot of the protein peptide world, and uh, you know, here's just an example by Faringa and coworkers where they could just control the um, IC50s of uh, antimicrobial activity using the dif different azobenzene groups. And this tetrafluorinated group, the one in the middle, can be controlled with green light. Um, and you may have seen this molecule more recently. This is a, a molecule that um, can inhibit uh, casein kinase one. It's published last year in Nature Communication by. Uh, Faringa and, and co-workers, um, but the different isoforms can be, can, can target different isoforms, which can ultimately perhaps control um, circadian rhythm, which might actually be nice for a conference like this because it could be potentially a cure for jet lag. So we were certainly not looking to cure jet lag, but we're interested in this tetrafluorinated group because um, it has a very, very long uh, half-life. Um, Stefan Hecht uh, measured and estimated these to be around uh, two years. It's a cis form of this tetrafluorinated group is uh, uh, very stable for up to two years. So we wanted to embed this within our sRNA, given what we know about the tetrachlorinated and the azobenic group. So this, but there wasn't really a good method to make these groups using, um, you know, a method such as, you know, something like Dirtron or Tata. So we had to go back 
to kind of roots chemistry, grassroots chemistry, and uh, so just, I'll just briefly describe the synthesis. I, I, I mean, I, I really like showing the synthesis because this really took you know a long time. It's a lot of effort. But uh, we start with the 2,6-dichloroaniline. We can brominate that, and then we can uh, do a copper uh, cyanide displacement of that bromine group, oxidize that with sodium hydroxide, and then we can do standard like EDC antibond coupling of a TDS-protected ethanolamine. And then uh, some beautiful work by Lynn and co-workers where they could take these amines, these aromatic amines like aniline, and they could actually generate a library of uh, azo benzene. So we took that example using DBU and NCS, and we were able to uh, generate this uh, symmetrical azo benzene tetrafluorinated group. And then the rest is really standard. Just remove the TBS groups, and then DNT protect one end, and then uh, phosphidylate. And then from there we have our uh, phosphoramidite. And in this case here, uh, the data I'm going to show you is we actually placed this, this tetrafluorinated group on the antisense strand, okay? And uh, our model system now is, again, as follows. We have an active strand, green light is able to inactivate that, and then blue light um, can reactivate that. So in this system here, um, we didn't want to keep these under green light for a long time. So we took an active sRNA, and then after transfection, we immediately added green light for a short period of time, and then just left the cells you know, alone in the dark for two days. Uh, check gene silencing later, and you can see there's no activity. There's no gene silencing happening. We can take the same type of experiment, inactivate it, and then a couple hours later, add blue light for a short period of time, and you can see we're getting good gene silencing. And if we compare that to our dark control, those are quite comparable. Um, so we did this in vitro assay for 72 hours, and again, just, just a burst of green light after transfection, let them sit in the dark for uh, almost three days, no gene silencing. Uh, we can, a couple hours later, add the blue light, and you can see we're getting gene silencing, which is similar to our, our dark control. Um, and then, if you remember, we wanted to test the reversibility as well on that first type of experiment. So we wanted to see whether we could control this in a reversible manner a couple of different times. So I'll walk you through this data. So the green experiment is the one I just described. So inactivate it and leave it sitting for two days. The blue is just like I described before. A couple hours later, add the blue light, let it sit, and you get gene silencing. The purple bar, which I'll describe in a second, is where we inactivate it. We keep it inactive for 24 hours. At 24 hour time point, we add blue light for a short period of time and then keep it in the dark. So in this case, it's been in an inactive state, inactive state for roughly equal duration. And you can see that we get, uh, you know, we, we get decent gene silencing occurring. The next one is a 1.5x, okay, so 1.5x green, blue, green. So we inactivate it with green light and then we add blue light a couple hours later. And then a couple hours later after that, we add green light. So it's only been in blue light activation for maybe just a, a couple of hours, and you can see that it really is not active at all. And then finally, if we do a similar type of experiment, just like what I described, but after that green light, a few hours later after that, we add the blue light, we can, again, we can get gene silencing occurring. And of course, here's our dark control. So we can do this for 48 hours, and we can also do the same type of experiment for up to 72 hours. We'd love to go longer, but our you know, within our, our cellular system, we are limited to uh, three days. So again, similar pattern, inactivation with green light, reactivate with the blue light. We can keep it inactive for a day, add blue light 24 hours later, as shown in purple. We can activate it, inactivate it, reactivate for just a little bit, but keep it inactive, as you can see in the light green. And then we can go through two full cycles where we do see some, some activation, but certainly not to the levels of the dark. And, um, you know, one thing that we might want to think about is, you know, this might offer a way also to fine-tune or control some sRNAs, one that's already deployed, right? So maybe using a little burst of blue or green light, maybe, um, you know, we could kind of fine-tune levels for, you know, individual needs or patients. So, in summary, we've gone from a system where we can have uh, reversible control of azobenzene, we can use UV light to control it's the activity, a visible light to control it back. We are limited, although because of the half-life of the cysts, um, so we have to use UV light persistently, which is not a good thing. Um, so kind of our first generation was 
to tetrachlorinated, and we have uh, red light inactivation, which was very effective. Um, violet light could, or thermal could, could bring it back, and here is sort of our LED contraption of um, how we do these experiments using low waters LED lights. Um, but we were also limited to the fact that um, these, these tetrachlorinated groups have a very rapid half-life and they have low thermal stability. So um, again, so that brought us to our tetrafluorinated version where we could have very good thermal stability with these and we could better control the gene silencing activity with, with green or, or blue light. And um, I think the first few points, so a summary in future directions, like I said, yeah, uh, we can control the activity, we can control the activity uh, with limited uh, due to the short half-life of UV light. We redshifted with tetrachlorinated groups, we redshifted with tetrafluorinated groups, so I, I mentioned that all on the previous slide. So, you know, you might be wondering what is the mechanism of action, certainly there's sort of a lot of different things we can think about for sure, um, you know, and uh, happy to have a discussion about that, absolutely. We're currently trying to look at the effects of, um, you know, what this might have in vivo, certainly that's what we're very much interested in. So we have a, you know, I don't have any data to present, but we have a student uh, in collaboration with Nina Simmons, a collaborator, where we're looking at these fluorescent Japanese uh, Medaka embryos, which are translucent, and we're hoping we can gain some insight into its um, ability to be photo control within an in vivo system. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, thank, um, you know, my, my lab group at Ontario Tech. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I'd like to acknowledge Matthew Hamill, who's, uh, who's here and is uh, also given the poster, like I mentioned, but during his PhD work, he spearheaded a lot of, uh, a lot of this work here. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank the funding agencies, and I'd like to thank uh, organizers, and I'd like to thank, thank you for all your attention. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, John Paul. Uh, we have questions. Yes, please uh, give your names and affiliations as we are now networking. We want to know who you are. So. Hi, uh, my name is Sean. I'm with uh, Eli Lilly. Uh, thanks for the talk. I appreciate it. Um, I had a question about uh, how you were quantifying when you were using your light setups. Um, uh, if they were like in glass or if you're using plastic, because depending on the wavelength of light, you get a different transmission through the material. I saw that on all of your light systems, the distance looked the same, but I was wondering about what was the actual transmission of the light. Okay, yeah, no, great, great question. So I didn't talk about some of the technical aspects of it. Those, those, those LED boxes, but one was bigger and a couple were smaller, but they were all the same size. I just brought it up a little bigger because I had more room. But uh, really what we've done is uh, we, we've created a, a box and uh, the light source, these LED strips we built, are exactly um, like 15 centimeters from the cell plate. And then what we also do during the experiment is we, we keep it uncovered so we don't keep it, uh, the plastic on there so we don't get deflection of, uh, for example, some of the, uh, the red light or whatever light that we have. Um, and some other technical things too is, I mean, we don't include some uh, things like phenol red or some other things inside of the media that might absorb some of the, the different colored lights. So we try to keep it as simple as possible to, to eliminate any artifacts, if that helps. Yeah. Um, did you measure the temperature at all? Did you have like fans going or was it like a covered system? So it was kept in the incubator at 37 degrees. Um, you know, we did have a, we did measure the temperature and these are low, sort of low, um, they, they emit a very low heat, but we didn't see any temperature increases, but it is in a controlled environment. So uh, we're confident that we kept them at 37 degrees. All right, great. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, my name is Supriya from Lili. So I have a question when you mentioned the term active and inactive. So cis and trans isomer of the adjuvant gene. So in sense of active and inactive, so what is the change in the SIRNA duplex structure? So what cis does and what trans does so it becomes active and inactive. Yeah. And what is the temperature? Is there change on TM or other things? So do you study on that? Yeah, no, that, that's, that, that's a great question. And it's something we've been asking ourselves a lot of. So, you know, when we try doing like thermal melts, for example, with you know, the, the azobenzene benzene or the tetrachlorinated groups, we are, you know, as soon as we start raising the temperature, we, we start relaxing that cis form to the, the trans form. So it really makes TM measurements especially complicated. 
Um, so we can't get an accurate TM measurement, but we do notice um, in, in general that the overall shapes of the molecules by circular dichroism remain relatively the same. We can see that A-form duplex. So we don't have you know, structural detail, but what we think is happening is that we are still maintaining good you know, hydrogen bond contacts on both sides with the A-form RNA duplex, but there might be some distortion at the middle that is affecting its ability to maybe load into risk, um, or, or maybe if it's in the antisensor and bind to the mRNA. So, but we don't, these are just speculations. Last question. Very yeah. Tokijun, the can from Yumas. Uh, I think this, my question is not directly related to your research, but I heard about inject your compound in the context of fully kept modified inside because your your modification looks like it's going to be hydrophobic. So I'm just curious about what the impact of your modification to the like a tissue distribution or something. Did you have you ever tried that? No. So I mean, we've worked within our our, our cell lines and. You know, we, we have tried, of course, seeing if it can go without a delivery agent, but we have to use standard sort of delivery protocols with like lipofectamine, um, you know, but, you know, it'd be, it'd be nice to, you know, look at adjusting some of those parameters with other chemical modifications to overcome some of those, uh, some of those issues, right? But it is fairly, uh, but, but we don't observe any solubility issues, even though that center core is quite hydrophobic. One last question. Uh, we have an online question from Alex Amatuni. Is there eventually an in vitro reduction, glutathione, etc., of the azobenzene to hydrazole benzene, benzene uh, resulting in loss of optical control? Yeah, no, that, okay, so, all right, so that, that, that's a really good question. And, okay, so I'll, I'll be as brief as, as I can. So, with the first generation azobenzene and second generation tetrachlorinated groups, uh, we didn't observe any, any reduction with glutathione. Um, up to 10 millimolar. Um, however, with our tetrafluorinated group, we actually saw, um, we did see reduction at those groups, um, you know, as monitored by HPLC. And some, some things I didn't talk about, just, you know, I didn't have time to talk about everything, but we did try this modification on the sense strand and uh, the tetrafluorinated group on the sense strand. And as time progressed, we actually didn't get uh, good gene silencing control. Meaning that as time progressed, when we added the lights, we, we didn't, uh, we were just seeing good gene silencing, which is not what we wanted. And what we speculate is happening is that um, within that duplex, it's not embedded within risk, and it's very likely getting reduced by glutathione. However, when it's in the antisense strand, perhaps there is some protection from reduction of glutathione because we can, very, we can control that very much very well. So to answer the question, we do observe reduction. However, we think when it's embedded in the risk complex with antisense, we don't get it's protected in some way, which is why we see that, that, that good activity. Okay, we need to move on. Thanks, John Paul, again Thank for the great talk. So the next two presentations.